Good afternoon, everyone. This is a special meeting of the City Council's Public Safety and Education Committee. We're out in the community. Uh, today, we're in the International District, and it is September 23rd, 2010, a little after 2 o'clock in the afternoon. I'm here with Councilmember uh, Sally Bagshaw. And our purpose today is to do a walking tour of the International District and over into Chinatown here in Little Saigon, a little bit of Japantown, and just talk to residents and business owners and others in the community about some of their um, public safety concerns. And uh, Tazy, why don't you come over and join us? And uh, why don't you introduce yourself sure. and tell us a little bit about you and then your concerns about your neighborhood. Okay. My name is uh, Tazy, Tazy Mersai. I'm the operations manager for uh, Lamb Seafood Market. Half a block down this way, we have the best seafood in town. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my biggest concern, I've been working at the market for the last uh, two years. And my biggest concern, and I was just telling a uh, gentleman from Como, uh, since the beginning of the year, we've had four break-ins to um, our employees' cars. We have an employee parking lot uh, uh, near Rainier, and uh, on, on King Street, they have a parking lot there. And it's been four times that, uh, and different times that uh, employees' cars got broken in and things stolen. Uh, we do, I do see a lot of uh, my, maybe transients or uh, you know, people who don't really have a business here or they seem to be aimless. Can't really tell them to go away uh, because they're on public uh, property. But at the same time, uh, I don't know if they're the ones that contribute to the break-ins or what. And. That, that's that's been my first-hand experience. Like I said, I've only been here about two years. Uh, I was asked if the problems have been getting worse or better. I don't know if two years is enough to gauge. Uh, so just to be honest with you, just the last uh, last six months or so, that's what I've seen as, as a, a problem for us. And what what does that kind of activity do to the neighborhood? Well, I do know that you know. I actually having having. Uh, I forgot to say that I've had also one customer car broken into as well. Um, I do not want customers to be uh, discouraged from coming here. I, we're, we're trying to revitalize Little Saigon as part of the international district. Uh, we want to grow our businesses. Uh, we not only have problems with traffic, but I do not want to compound the, the problem with uh, those kinds of activities discouraging people from driving down here. It's a great place. It's a great place, but I don't, I don't want people to be scared to come down here. Sure, sure. So tell us again, uh, what's the name of your business? Uh, Lamb's Seafood Market. And where is it located? Uh, just half a block down uh, on, uh, on entrance on King Street. So between yeah. 12th Avenue South and Rainier. In, Ra in Rainier, yep. yes. So we'll probably have to stop by and sample sometime. You must. Uh, <laughs> great seafood, great uh, produce, and uh, we have a great deli too. Well, we love to support uh, local businesses as well. We appreciate well. that. Yeah. That would be great. And, and Tim, well, as we're walking, I know it's a big crowd, but we would like to hear from people about solutions as well, not just problems. You know, we know about the traffic. We appreciate what you're telling us about the break-ins. And if people have ideas or if the officers who are here would like to chime in and give us suggestions for public safety or things that they would like to involve, we want to encourage that. So we also see Hey Out Kim and a lot, and Jan Campbell's here, and Jan Johnson, and there are a lot of folks that we would like to introduce as well. We'll do that, and we're going to walk uh, to about six different locations okay. uh, on our tour, and we'll be stopping, and then we'll pick up the filming again when we arrive at the next location. Very good. And uh, we'll see what we learn. Very good. Good. So let's go to uh, 10th Avenue and uh, South King Street. Very good. We'll move along. Very good. Okay. There's a lot of... So we're reconvening here at the intersection of uh, 10th Avenue South and South King Street. We're with Michael Yee. Why don't you uh, tell us what your involvement is here in the International District? Well, I started working down here in 1991, and since then I've been pretty active uh, related to public safety issues and organizing back in the early 90s with other groups like Interim and Housing Alliance. And so we've had monthly meetings with the police and with the community for, for almost 20 years now. And so I think I've been around long enough to kind of see what works and doesn't work in, in public safety issues. And so I think one of the long-standing issues has been the coordination between West Precinct and East Precinct as, as it relates to kind of uh, how police patrols and stuff are assigned down here. 
and you know although you, you can kind of count on them to communicate to each other uh, this barrier of I-5 that divides West Precinct and East, East Precinct is not something that crime pays attention to so a lot of the crime floats between the two precincts and so it just demands a lot more kind of coordination and it'd be a lot easier if if the community can be combined in under one precinct and coordinating that way. It certainly has been something we've been advocating for years. Mm -hmm. So, and we've heard about that issue and your advocacy for that. Um, talk about your perspective about what the major problems are in addition to that and what you think good solutions would be. Well, I think com community and, and working with the police is an ongoing diligence issue. I, I don't think there's ever a a solution that gets you there. I think it, it's an ongoing dialogue that has to happen, you know, month after month. And I think there's two issues that impact that a lot. One is there's changes within the community and changes within the police department, which are much more automatic within the police force. And so you're always having to renew those relationships. And so I, I think as long as you have that ongoing dialogue with those officers and those teams, that's helpful. Uh, adding two precincts and having that means there's twice as many people to have to try to do that with. And that's just tough on, on both sides. I think there's uh, the, the whole issue about cutting crime prevention unit has become a big issue for us because within that consistency for, for 20 years, I've worked with some of the same people within the police department, such as Francisco Teo, Terry uh, Johnson and stuff. And you have that consistency of people to go to and talk to and be a resource to the community. And the thought of losing them, I think, would be a huge detriment to the, to, to the entire city. So in terms of uh, the businesses and the residents of this area, what do, what do you think their primary concerns are when it comes to public safety? I think that the, the the intimidation level of things that happen on, on the street day to day, and you can't ever pick a specific hour when it happens, it could be seven in the morning or two at night, would be just kind of the street level drug dealing, prostitution uh, that occurs and it just you know ebbs and flows with the rest of downtown. I, I think that's an ongoing issue that's always present in an urban neighborhood. And what does that do to the neighborhood? Well, I think it, it makes a lot of the elderly want to stay, stay home at night and that's not something we want. They should be active and feeling safe about going out at night. I think our recent uh, block watch patrols has been a, a great success uh, for groups of 20, 30, 40 people to come out at night and walk. It says a lot about the people really becoming active about trying to take back the streets. Uh, but that's only a few nights a week right now. Uh, and what happens when they're not out there? Uh, I, there's been a lot of talk about reinstituting a walking beat, which is something our community, and I know Pioneer Square has advocated for a long time. We'd like to see a return to that uh, again, and, but we know that's another budget issue. Uh, so I think those would be great, great solutions. Those are very practical, and I appreciate it, Michael. Um, Sergeant, I don't know if you were able to hear Ms. Lee's suggestions, but it included more walking beats, uh, better uh, communication between East and West precincts. We know that that's not your fault in any way. It's just a fact that yeah. between East and West is Chinatown and ID District. Yeah, you know, and we've actually... Maybe, maybe, Paul, you can introduce yourself uh, first. Paul Gracie, I'm the sergeant for the West okay, Precinct Community Police Team. We've, uh, excuse me, we've actually uh, made a bona fide effort this summer to actually join our teams. Uh, sergeant Chin, who's over here, he's in charge of the East Precinct Community Police Team. Uh, Casey Sundin and uh, Eric Warner, who work for me. Eric, Eric works for me, Casey works for, uh, for Jay. And we've been pairing them up and we've actually been walking where we will be down here in Chinatown International District then we'll go up to Little Saigon. And we, while we have to have a, a known uh, area of responsibility, we understand that the people, the bad guys, they don't respect that. So we do try to float back and forth and we do exchange information. So we're trying to improve on that. Do you think there's been an improvement this summer? I, I think so. I, I believe so. There are some uh, civility issues that you know need to be addressed. But um, you know, as it was stated, it's an ebb and flow thing. We have to move our resources to where we find those issues. And right. uh, that's, that's what a real important part is having that communication with the community because they're here 24-7. Yes, we are, but not the same officers. You live here, you know more what's going on in your neighborhood than, than I do. So I need to have that uh, working relationship with, with the community members to make sure that uh, we keep in tune. And, and I would add that, you know, for years and years now, since, since the mid-90s, there's been an ongoing dialogue with the community police team. I, I don't think that's an issue. That, mm -hmm. That's gone on for years now. And, 
and, and we're comfortable with that. It's really the resources that are given to the entire community from the police department. And that could be just a whole new pool of money, whatever it may be, to allow them to have the walking beats and those kinds of issues. Right. Well, I know we hear from every neighborhood in the city, the more dialogue between the police and the community, uh, the better the relationship. And, and it's a very effective uh, crime fighting strategy. So. And, and you mentioned Terry Johnston, and I agree. She's one of my heroes. And just how she reaches out to the public and is able to be a bridge between civilians and police officers, it's extremely helpful. And I'm just wondering, is there something, if you would advise Tim and me, if you would advise the council, what would you ask for? And recognizing that we've got you know, the budget problems, but what specific things might you recommend that we consider? Well, we're putting you on the spot here. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, yeah. luckily I'm close to retirement. Yeah. Uh, you know, t Terry is, is very important. Terry reports to me, and she, she's very important. She's a very, uh, a very go-to person. So if you have to make cuts, I understand you have to make cuts, but maybe not all of it. Maybe a little bit here and there. Leave a, leave a couple, and we, we can work with that. We can, you know, spread that out a little bit more and do what we can do. But to totally remove something is, is you know, then, then we're going to have a real issue. But if we do some cutbacks, we're just going to have to learn to adapt and adjust the best we can. How would you always know if Terry and the rest of that unit is doing their job? Hopefully it's by crime not happening or people feeling safer, and you wouldn't necessarily have a measure of that readily. And so I think the idea of just doing away with crime prevention would be a huge loss, not just to the community, but to the police officers that rely on them to, to pick up a piece of the work with the community, which yeah. they do a lot of. Yeah. You know, Terry does all my block watches, and that's, that's a body of work that I don't have an officer to, to do right now. And, I forget what the number was last year. It was in the, in the thousands during the uh, one night night watch right. thing, and it, it's amazing how much work they actually do. That, uh, as was stated, we, we can't. There's no way to really uh, measure it. It's just something you know is getting done, right. and and it's appreciated, I'm sure, by the community and and by myself. Well, I can say that the measurements that I look at are the number of compliments that I hear mm -hmm. about Terry and also Diane Horswell up in uh, North Precinct. North. It's just amazing how many people have said to me. These women are doing so much. They are who we go to as citizens to mm -hmm. talk to. So congratulations and thanks for having them well, and, thank all, you. and for recognizing their talents. We, we do appreciate their work. Michael, anything else you want to add before we move on here nope. on our tour? Nope. Thank you all for right. coming down. Yeah, so thank you very much, Michael. We're going to move uh, further west to Hinghe Park. Yes, very good. Let's do it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, we're doing a little interim stop here on our way to Hinghe Park and as we were walking some of the community members were telling me about this particular block underneath Interstate 5 because they're trying to activate this so that there's more people and people feel safe here and we're going to chat about this and tell me tell me your name and how you're involved here. I'm with Interim ICDA. I manage a parking lot across the street. It's a 230 stall parking lot. A lot of things I see is we have uh, drug dealings, transients, uh, people sleeping um, day and night, uh, both across the street, up above here. Um, there's a push to revitalize King Street, and one of the things that they want to do is decorate these columns here. Um, almost the same, you know, different design, but similar to what was done on Jackson Street. Um, so, so, so and you think the design alone is going to make a difference for you? I think the des design will make King Street look more attractive. Um, and I think until we get rid of or have uh, the transients and drug dealers out of the area, it's very hard to get people to come down. But this is a very um, popular place to park on the street because it's a two-hour no-pay uh, limit. Uh, so we do get a lot of traffic on King Street. And I know the food bank for the uh, Asian Counseling Service is in the next block. Yes. And there's a lot of elderly people that walk yes. this route to go to the food bank. They do every Wednesday and Friday. They line up uh, 8 in the morning, before 8 in the morning. And so they're in and out of there all day. How about plans to improve the lighting conditions here at night? Is that um, part of the plan? I haven't heard. Is there Right. So right now we've got hello. Hi. We've got uh, uh, through the Office of Economic Development, a lot of the property and business owners along the King Street corridor, but really throughout the entire district, have been working on prioritizing some um, action steps 
to address a variety of different topics, and one of the things that they identified for the King, for this part of the King Street corridor was to activate this space underneath the freeway overpass. If you look on the South Jackson side, you'll see the beautiful artwork and the colonnades that really not only distinguish the character of this neighborhood, but really gives a sense that people live here, people care about this neighborhood. We're trying to do the same thing on, on this part of, uh, of the street in the neighborhood, really um, improve better lighting, but also some artwork to, sh to say that this is a community and a neighborhood that people care about. Great, so and we're gonna... Opportunities for like food carts or anything like that, Hale, hey, under here? No, but we'd love to talk with you more about that. <laughs> so, and we're gonna see you a little bit later on our tour, huh? That's good. Uh, let's bring uh, Sergeant Shin over here. So I, I, had, I had asked Sergeant Shin, and this was in response to a question that we had had a few blocks ago about car break-ins down here, and I asked him if he could talk to us about ways that people can be safer, that where they park their car or how they park their car, what kinds of tips that he might give to people who park down here. So I'm going to turn the mic over to Sergeant Shin. Certainly. Um, certainly, you know, we, from the police standpoint, there are certain things that we try to do, of course. But on the other flip side, obviously the citizens themselves, there are things that they can do to minimize uh, being vulnerable to car prowls. You know, obviously certain spots, if it's dark, if it's kind of hidden out of place, and sort of, um, those can be more vulnerable. If you're leaving items inside your car that uh, appear to be valuable, then there's a reason for somebody who might want to break in, opposed to nothing being visible inside the car. So those are just some of the things um, I think maybe the individual themselves can try to be prepared and be aware of. That way they are minimizing sort of the vulnerability. And those are some of the tips that we try to give out to the block watches and all the citizens there. Certainly there's no guarantee, but you know, if you can minimize, like I said, being a victim, uh, that's all the more better for everybody. So I asked the sergeant, uh, because I had heard something on Car Talk last weekend, and the question was, a woman had said that her car had just been broken into and her battery had been stolen. They said, why would somebody take an old battery? And the answer was because what the thieves want are your new battery. They know you're going to have to put a new battery into the car and then they're going to come get that one. And so I was asking him whether that there was any fact to that and that if you're, is your car more vulnerable if people know what's in it? Absolutely. I mean, that, for that victim who... Uh had the car broken into and the battery stolen, you know, if I was that individual, you always don't want to park in the same vicinity or the same uh, spot because the bad guy who broke into the first place uh, will re readily recognize it and, and you may be a victim the second time around. So if people are aware of those things, I think they can minimize being a victim. Good. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. You're welcome. Shall we keep going? Please. Hing Hei Park is next stop. So we, we've now arrived, uh, Councilmember Bagshaw, at Hing Hei Park, which within about a year is going to be expanded to the west, which will be great. The park will be larger. Uh, and let's have our two guests introduce themselves first. Hi, Michael winkler Chin with the Seattle Chinatown International District Preservation and Development Authority. I'm Alan Lai. I'm the Crime Victim Service Director with CISC as Chinese Information and Service Center. Great, so tell us a little bit about this particular intersection and the park uh, in particular. Would you like to start? Uh, now, if we look around now, it's uh, peaceful and quiet. Uh, yes. Like I said, I like to use the term, this kind of tour is great, uh, but it's announced, so it's a little bit artificial. Now, for the last three months, you know, the police department have mentioned about doing more, more foot patrol, but I do not see it a whole lot of foot patrol um, by the officers. Uh, so I'm, I really encourage you council members to come down again and announce in the evening and then that way you'll see the real picture. Over here at the nighttime, people are not comfortable coming out because there's a whole lot of uh, drug dealing, this corner, that corner, across the street. Uh, and there's uh, prostitution, uh, there's uh, outside the restaurant doors, there's always uh, panhandling. Many times it evolves into aggressive panhandling. I have a lot of uh, restaurant owners talking to me about all those aggressive panhandling is really affecting the business. Michael, you something to add? Yeah, I, th I think this corner, as Alan mentioned, yes. is also a very active corner within the district. Um, I think there's some issues. The Tsutakawa sculpture there is absolutely beautiful, but you've got that sitting area and lots of times you see a lot of people that are just kind of loitering and things passing between their hands. 
I think uh, at night, this neighborhood really changes. During the daytime, you, you see a lot of foot activity with, with the businesses, people leaving their businesses, coming out, doing uh, lunch and whatnot, which keeps the streets active and moving. But I think at nighttime, that kind of slowed down and it is not a very pleasant place sometimes. You've got a lot of aggressive panhandling, uh, kind of threatening behavior. I think one thing that Alan brought up earlier, which is really important, and I hate to sound redundant, but it is, public safety is a very broad issue and everybody has their part. I think culturally, Asian communities oftentimes don't want to call the police. It's um, something that you don't do and it's actually quite scary. And I think that it's helpful to have officers that kind of reflect the diversity of the community, but also not just officers, but I guess I would call them civilian police people that help educate people and make working with the police less scary and help helping the greater community understand what their role is in public safety as well. And I know both of you do that very effectively yourselves. And I'm sorry that you have the street disorder problems that you have. Um, you're not unique in the city. Other areas of the city have it as well, which is not an excuse, but uh, I think we recognize that we have to do a lot more. Yeah, over the years, we've done a lot of workshop teaching people how to call 911, how to get service without speaking too much English, telling them how to say English, English, or Chinese, Chinese, uh, what is the name Chinese, what happened Chinese, and then the 911 dispatchers would catch on that you only speak Chinese language, and they will uh, send, uh, 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 they will summon a Chinese interpreter to help out. And I work closely with the 911 director, and we do have some 911 uh, dispatchers coming out to uh, the workshop to talk to people. Uh, but Chinese have many different dialects. One time I found out that uh, a Chinese victim called 911, keeps saying Chinese, and. Uh, he didn't get the help, but through the conversation with the 911 dispatchers, we found out that the dispatcher was asking which Chinese dialect, was it Mandarin or uh, Cantonese, and we have the communication with the dispatchers now, if in doubt, uh, Mandarin is official Chinese dialect, send a Mandarin interpreter. So those miscommunication becomes communications, but that doesn't happen overnight. And like I said, Chinese have, and Asians, for that matter, have thousands of years of uh, 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 history, and that affect the way we approach the government offices. I have to repeat this one more time. The Chinese proverb says, when I die, I do not want to go to hell, and as long as I'm living, I do not want to set my foot in any government office. This is the Chinese culture is affecting all the Asian population too. So we have thousands of years of culture uh, to battle with, and uh, we need the help of F each and every one of the uh, crime prevention coordinators and uh, good council members like you both. Thank you. Well, thank you. Well, I have a couple of things I'd like to follow up on. And one is I want to thank you and your organization who invited me some months ago to come down here at midnight. And I had Bernie and one of his colleagues Johnny. walk with me and take me into some of these buildings. So I got to see firsthand the prostitution, the drug deals Good. that were going on, Good. the noise that was down here. Uh -huh. And it was very um, eye-opening for me just to be able to appreciate what's going on down here. And I've got Sergeant Chen right next to me, and I don't know if the two of you know each other, but he's been terrific about coming with me and also talking about what the police are doing, and so I just wanted to give him a moment to say hello to you too. Well, first of all, I think those are two good points um, just discussed, that there is a, a tendency at times for um, some people to not call the police because of language barrier and so forth. But um, we certainly do actually have all those programs with language lines. It's just getting the word out to the regular citizens who, who are not aware that exists. So that's why they're reluctant. So it's bridging that gap. But uh, in terms of the, um, you know, the crime down here, I think um, Councilperson Bagsha mentioned that about footbeats. Uh, some of you are aware that years ago we did have footbeats, and I think that made a lot of difference because you can see them here on a daily basis. And that was when staffing was a little bit uh, better situation back then, and I'm sure the captains working out of this precinct would love to have uh, some type of permanent footbeats, but it's just trying to uh, navigate and balance with what staffing we currently have. Um, I, don't know, I don't know what the future holds, but um, I, I think that's not a question for us as police to try to have a uh, footbeat down here. 
So, so I have a question, and this is something um, that Councilmember Burgess had mentioned to me, and that is for the police department to focus on hot spots as contrasted to trying to be everywhere all the time. Um, can you comment on that? Yes, and, and that's a good that's a good issue, a topic, because you know, one end you can try to prevent and maintain, uh, which is the better situation. But like I mentioned about the staffing issue, sometimes we don't have the resources to be able to do that, and so we have to kind of put the fires out where they're happening. Unfortunately, trying to maintain that is the key, and yet there's other fires that we put out, and so we have to kind of allocate the resource differently. And so sometimes it goes in cycles, um, but you know, it's trying to balance that is basically, I guess, the key. Yes? I have a question for you. I, I know that the International District, or the Chinatown International District, is actually split into two different precincts. Yes. And, but, Residents here don't necessarily understand uh, victims of crimes, as well as people perpetrating crimes, don't really know when they're whoops or they're right. wandering from one to another. It seems like it would make some sense to try to link it, or try to somehow better connect it, make it all fall in, into one precinct. Yeah, on paper, I, I, I could see that argument certainly, but you know, for us, just because of a particular street doesn't it's one end. You know, we actually try to work together with both precincts. We really do. And so for us, it's not really um, all that much different. We don't stop our responsibility because it's, you know, 50 yards on the one side. We really do. We work closely with West Precinct. Sergeant Gracie, Captain Brown. I know Captain Dermody works very close with Captain Brown. In fact, we have several different projects we're actually coordinating together. So, you know, an average citizen might not understand that and think, well, you know, we, we like everything to be together. Um, but we do, we really work together and try to address the overall problem. I don't know if that answers your question. So I don't want to leave a negative impression that the International District is this place that's overwhelmed with crime uh, because I know that's not the case. And we come down here for lunch or dinner and to shop and to and see people. And you should people. keep coming down. And, and we will, <laughs> we will, down. We we will keep coming. Yeah. But Tell us a little bit about some of the exciting, positive things that are happening here in the community. I was going to say Sergeant Shin is a regular customer, just a few. Maybe a year ago, together, we worked on that uh, uh, Japanese church right on that corner. Yes. Uh, the Japanese church, the Chinese Baptist church, and also the, the, uh, the Buddhist society. Yes. And we, we have done things together, and we would like to invite you, uh, Sergeant Shin, and council members to continue to do that. Now, sometimes the foot patrol, when you have that blue uniform coming out, you don't see as much as we do. We are ordinary citizens. But if we invite you, when you have time, plain clothes come down, and you are welcome to, I, I'll be happy to coordinate with you and the apartment managers, and say, look from the second floor when your, your, your blue uniform is not in presence, and see what the real world is, or the, the real activities are. I think another thing that I'd like to highlight, which is probably, you wouldn't think of it as a public safety concept, but it is uh, the Storefront Seattle project that we've worked on with the BIA and with the Alliance for Pioneer Square and the Office of um, Arts and Culture at the, at the city of Seattle. And it's a slightly different approach. Um, vacant storefronts leave kind of a, a dark hole as you're walking through the landscape of the neighborhood. And we are hoping that by kind of adding some positive energy and some positive activity, it then attracts more positive foot traffic right. into the neighborhood and helps dispel some of those um, dark spots, right. dark pockets. And the storefront program is to also showcase local artists and right. others. Yeah, so we and have some you, right back there. Yeah. Um, the pinball museum right the across the street. The pinball museum is the coolest here. thing I'd over there. there. 30 it's, different it's, uh, pinball machines in there, historic, and it's all free for kids to come in and play. It's a real positive right. and if you look up here at the, uh, the lanterns, that's also uh, part of the activation of the park from the summer's night market. That was a, a partnership with the Parks Department, who's been really helpful doing Center City Park activation this summer. And without them, we wouldn't have had the movies in the in the park. And you know, the, and the help with the park rangers really do keep that positive, like you're saying, like not just about police on the streets, but it's kind of that community in, in light, uh, enlivening the neighborhood. And Don brings up a great thing. I'm sorry, it's it is the park rangers. The park rangers should also be kind of considered in this whole greater discussion about public safety, at least in the center city parks. I think um, for a lot of people, seeing somebody in a uniform um, really helps dispel some of the negative activity sometimes. And, and I think the park rangers are great 
was a great way of doing that. Absolutely. So I think we're going to move to an alley entrance. I'd love you, to. Are you going to take us there, Don? <laughs> yeah. All right. <laughs> lead, lead the way. And All right. make sure that Don introduces himself yeah, we'll next time so we can yep, explain we what great things Don. he's doing. <laughs> yeah, I, I was, I was So, Don, we're still on South King Street, but yes. we're at an alley entrance. So introduce yourself and tell us where we are. I am Don Blakeney with the uh, Chinatown International District Business Improvement Area. And uh, we're standing right here across from Hinghe Park at one of our alleys. And as you can kind of see, there's uh, some dumpsters on both sides of the alleys. All sorts of stuff gets put back here. But this kind of a, it's not exactly a fair representation. Usually there's actually a bigger buildup of garbage. And you can see the kind of the people walk by and put their lattes out here. And um, this kind of, unfortunately, people on TV won't be able to smell kind of the wonderful aroma that's <laughs> unique to this alley. But, uh, you know, there's all sorts of stuff that happens around the alleys. And so it's, it's kind of a focus of the neighborhood. We're looking at trying to make the alleys safer and in some cases activate the alleys. Um, uh, one of the, there's, a, there's a whole confluence of issues that comes, uh, comes about with the alleys. Basically, you're looking at um, many different service providers for recycling, uh, and so it's hard to kind of figure out and dive down on who's uh, responsible for which dumpster. And then there's also a lot of free riding in these alleys because there was a shared dumpster program many years ago, and we still are recovering from that. So there's people putting garbage on top of dumpsters who don't necessarily have their own service. And you combine that with, um, we used to have 30 garbage cans in the neighborhood, and they've reduced it down to 12. So, you know, people don't have places to set down their latte, and so we see kind of some of the stuff like this. But some of the good stuff that's coming out uh, in the near future is we're looking to partner with some of the business and property owners up in Canton Alley next to Wing Luke Museum. And maybe Gary Johnson, who's worked on that for uh, a number of, uh, almost a year now, to kind of pull the, these stakeholders together to get that to happen. Maybe he could talk a little bit about uh, that program and uh, what's in store for Canton Alley coming so forward. So before we hear from Gary, why does this matter? Why is this issue important to you? This is a very important issue because what it does is um, at night, and Sally can talk about this a little bit because she's been down here um, on a tour, but at night there's a lot of crime in the alleys. There's prostitution, there's drug dealing, there's a lot of dark spots that have where people can hide behind a dumpster and they can, uh, you know, do all sorts of different things that, uh, you know, and, and basically it, it invites that kind of behavior. If you look at places like downtown Seattle and Pioneer Square, they've gotten rid of their, their dumpsters and it's made a big impact and people yeah. are activating it. There's going to be a fashion show in an alley over there later next yeah, month. It's made a huge difference. Yeah. So, Gary, why don't you come in here, introduce yourself, and um, um, tell us about the Dumpster Free Alley program. Okay, Gary Johnson, City of Seattle Department of Planning and Development. Um, the city has had a mandatory um, project called Clear Alleys program in place for a, for a little over a year, about a year and a half now, and it includes four of the five downtown neighborhoods, and it's a program that prohibits the placement of dumpsters in on city-owned right-of-way, so alleys, parking strips, sidewalks, and we, when we were contemplating the, a mandatory program, we intentionally decided not to include the Chinatown International District in the first go-round, primarily because of language and culture issues we felt like we needed to take the opportunity to do an educa broader education process with the neighborhood before um, impl considering implementing a, a mandatory program. And so we've started with a, a voluntary pilot project in the alley on Canton Alley, which is bounded on one end by the new uh, Wing Luke Asian Museum and on the other end by the Zhonghua building. And all of the property owners have agreed uh, voluntarily to launch uh, a clear alley project. And we're hopeful that that, and we're looking at October probably as a launch date, and we're hopeful that it will serve as a real demonstration alley for the for the rest of the neighborhood to, to show how a really urban mixed-use neighborhood like this with lots of restaurants and, and residential uh, upper story uses and other retail businesses um, can work with the Clear Alley program. And as Don said, that it just, there are so many benefits that can, can accrue from getting the cover that the dumpsters provide out of the alleys. Now, I think that the program Program in really any alley has the opportunity to change an alley from at least a negative to a neutral. But I think this neighborhood really has the opportunity to to turn the alleys into positives, yeah, and it's one sure. of the one of the few neighborhoods downtown that has long had a, a, a handful of retail uses um, in the alleys, like Liam's Fish Market has been operating out of the alley for decades. Um, Donnie Chin just moved his family's retail business into the Canton Alley in the, in the alley we're talking about for our pilot. So well, we've the, seen such great success in the International District, excuse me, Pioneer Square right. downtown up in the bell town. Right. When you're ready to do it here, let us know. Because okay. I think we'll be very supportive. Well, Great. I think Thank Don you. wants to talk about that. He <laughs> just showed me an alley about three blocks back there that was 
filled with dumpsters, but filled with garbage too. And there's no reason for that because we've seen how successful it was. And I really want to commend Todd Vogel and the, the people that were, you know, Feet First and other organizations that are saying we can clean these out and recover the space. And and it has just made it vibrant. There's they have um, art exhibits down there sometimes, and they've had I've been to parties. They were showing the, the world. Alleys. They had the World Cup playing in the alley, so people on their lunch yeah. break would come down and watch the World Cup. Yeah. So it makes would a big you, difference. Um, Don, would you tell us a little bit more about that one uh, alley that you showed me that was just full of dumpsters, and you said there were like five different recycling entities that so, were responsible for cleanup? Absolutely. So um, basically, we have a garbage contract with waste management down here, and they do all of the garbage work. But with the recycling, it's kind of an open market, so people can choose which provider they use. And so you'll give on any given alley, you'll see dumpsters from Allied Waste, from Cedar Grove, from Waste Management, um, and uh, Cleanscapes. And it's hard as a business improvement area to kind of dive after mm -hmm. problems that arise because you have five numbers to call, and some of those companies don't necessarily tell you which contracts they have with which businesses. And so with, with that kind of open contract system, in a neighborhood like this, especially when there's a language barrier occasionally, there's there's a lot of complications that arise and it makes it hard to uh, to really keep after and, and keep these things safe and clean. So is this something that we work with with Seattle Public Utilities? Do we talk with our buddy Ray Hoffman or what are the next steps? I think the next steps are maybe looking at doing the, the mandatory Clear Alleys program. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a combination of the Clear Alleys program, but then also bringing in the coordination with the pickup so you don't have bags sitting out that folks can go through or seagulls can come down. And seagulls and rats love to open up bags and bring stuff all over the street. And so, um, you know, it's, it's a matter of coordination, I think. Great. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate your time. That's very We're good. We're going to move on um, up toward Japantown. Okay. You know, Interim did this. this these guys that are right here, they take their rainwater off the roof and it filters through these cisterns before it goes and cleans it that way. Very cool. So uh, we've moved to Maynard Avenue South and South Main Street in what's called Japantown, which is one of the three um, neighborhoods of the International District. And we're right here in front of the Danny Wu International Community Garden. So I'm gonna have all three of you introduce yourselves first. We'll start here. Uh, I'm talking. I am a property owner in Chinatown. I was uh, born in Canton Alley and I grew up in Chinatown. I'm the president of the Gates Foundation that built the gate on Fifth Avenue and, right. and to help beautify the uh, uh, Chinatown area. And so we're going to come back to you in just a second. We'll let others introduce themselves. I'm Heo Kim. I'm the executive director for Interim Community Development Association. And we just walked by your new complete Our, street. Yes. yes. Well, Beautiful. My name is Jonathan Chen, and I manage the Danny Wu Community Garden uh, for Interim CDA. So we're going to start with you, Jonathan. Sure. Tell us about the park and what's it significant in the, about it in the neighborhood. So this park started in 1975, and in 1975, uh, our organization thought that the residents of this community, residents here who come from different countries throughout Asia, need to feel like they're part, that, that they bring home, uh, they bring here, part of home and that part of home is growing their own food because to them growing their own food is as common as it is for us to go to IGA or Safeway or Whole Foods and so we built this community garden for them and it's grown to 1.5 acres there are about um, 70 gardeners who grow food here and there are about a hundred different plots um, now um, they're half of them come from mainland China a third of them come from Korea handful from Taiwan, um, a family from the Philippines, a gardener from Mexico, and a couple of native English-speaking gardeners. So, Jonathan, would you tell us a little bit about how the gardeners share what they grow with each other? Sure, certainly. Um, a lot of the gardeners, <clears throat> because one patch of land has a lot more sun or one patch of land has a lot more sandy soil, this gardener can grow peppers here really, really well because it's really hot. This gardener can grow roots here, like certain radishes, really, really well because the soil is more sandy. And so one gardener grows, majority of her garden is full of radishes. Majority of this other gardener's is uh, full of peppers. And so what they do is they just trade with each other. I'll grow some radishes here and I'll give it to you if you exchange some peppers for me. In addition, a lot of these gardeners, they're, they're elderly citizens. The average age of the gardener is 76 years old. The majority of the gardeners here are in their 80s, and they climb up these stairs 
day after day for decades. Now, not everyone can come here all the time, especially during the summertime when the garden needs to be watered. And so they take turns. One gardener will water someone else's garden bed because they can't do it every single day. So it's a very, this garden, the reason why it's called a community garden because it instills the sense of community, not just with people being together, but people sharing things, people sharing space, sharing tasks, sharing responsibility, and sharing just the wonderful nature of this garden. I, I love uh, hearing you and watching you, your passion and your commitment to this project is obvious. Thank Jonathan, you. you do a great job. <laughs> Thank and, you. And Thank how you. many grandparents do you have now? <laughs> oh, there are, I went around with um, a Korean, um, a Korean translator one, one afternoon, and I was trying to ask uh, the Korean translator to talk with several of the Korean gardeners around because I rarely get to hear what they want to talk about, what they want to address to me. And many of them, one of them said that this is, I have two sons, one real son, and this is my other son. She was pointing to me. And another gardener was telling me that she was, the Korean gardeners are very, um, very physical with me, let's just put it that way. And she, she approached me and she was hugging me like this, saying, this is my grandson. <laughs> um, so I have many, many grandparents here. And like, and like grandparents, they, you know, like your, grand, your grandparents, it's very hard to be um, uh, a figure of an authority with your grandparent. Like, don't do this. Please don't grow things here. <laughs> and they would say, no, I'm going to grow things here. You're, you're like one third my age. Maybe, maybe we could come down and take lessons from Jonathan because people don't hug us very often, do they? I want to go back to this gentleman because we walked by the uh, gate down here that's yes. the entrance to Chinatown. Right. And you wanted to share a few concerns that you have about that area. Well, my major concern is for the whole Chinatown International District. Uh, loitering is a big problem. We started to work on that problem maybe 10, 12 years ago, and we said, well, you got to put no loitering sign, no trespassing sign, you got to call 911, you got to clean your alleys, you got to light up your alleys. And we're trying to do that, but still, um, there's transit, uh, there's loiters coming in, there are dope peddlers, there are prostitutes, there are uh, there are uh, transients from the I-5 jungle and lately it's worse because now you have groups of them coming down with backpacks and they hang around the corners, they walk up and down the streets and it's, you can't tell a, a good loiterer from a bad one. <laughs> so so the, we, we've, we've gotten the, the uh, name that the Chinatown International District is not safe and they they start not to want to walk down the street when there's some transient-looking person on that side of the street. And, and, and sometimes they stay in a cluster and we have to walk around them. And then they, they do all kinds of things like urinating against a tree in public, doing stuff in the alleys, and it's just a mess. And I'm on the block watch Tuesday and Thursday, and it's real funny because when we come, they leave and they come right back behind us. So it's really difficult to control those things. And we don't even have the right because of an ordinance to go up and ask them, uh, do you live here? What are you doing here? Are you going somewhere? So we need some help. I don't know what kind of help we need, but we need stronger ordinances so we can, uh, can kind of clean up the streets. And it's already taken effect because uh, our Chinese schools, there's a half dozen parents saying, we're taking our children out of your class because we don't want to come down here at night to pick them up because we're, we're afraid. And also one night uh, we were block watching and, uh, and um, a lady from New York ran to us for protection because some, uh, some uh, transient or some person tried to ask her panhandle for her. So anyways, we need help. I don't know what we can do. Uh, I think we have to change our brand of pesticide. <laughs> well, <laughs> one of the reasons we're here is to see what you're doing in the community. And, it, mm -hmm. and frankly, it's been quite impressive the way the community is organized and the neighborhood is organized yeah. and um, and also working with our police department is important as, mm -hmm. it also and, and, and we'll help you do that. Well, I want to bring the, the trouble with it, you know, it's all times of the, of the night, all times of the day, 24-7. I mean, it's, it's you can come anytime, it's look clean, the next minute it's full. Sure. They have telephones and they communicate and they, they drop to the corner and say, come on King and 8th and pick up your drugs. And here they are, they take their deal and they're gone. Okay. So I want to bring Hyokin, please. Uh, 
I just wanted to say, you know, Jonathan spoke um, about the sense of community that places like the Danny Wu Garden give to a neighborhood. It's that sort of public space, even though it's not technically, uh, it's actually a combination of private property as well as city property. It really is a public space. And uh, it's one of the issues that we have in this neighborhood is the lack of public space, especially green uh, public spaces that uh, people feel as though they can come to, that children, um, you know, the, there's a, a, a group of folks uh, called the uh, the Friends of the International Children's Park that have been working for the last couple of years to uh, make some improvements to the Children's Park, which is on the other side of the neighborhood. But uh, the Danny Wu Garden, the Children's Park, Hing Hay Park, there are very few, too few public spaces where people can congregate and feel safe in. And I think that speaks to some of the issues that Mr. Eng was talking about, that, you know, you walk around in the park and uh, come dusk, come dawn, um, people don't feel safe. One of the things that Jonathan didn't mention that he actually sees on a day-to-day uh, -day basis uh, the Danny Wu Community Garden along with Kobe Terrace represents about 1.5 acres of uh, the largest green space that we have in this neighborhood and yet when uh, Jonathan comes out when our garden our aging gardeners come out early you know even before the Sun uh, rises um, they're either confronted by uh, needles on the ground or uh, the remnants of nocturnal activities lots of drug use um, that still happen in this garden and uh, the creative space of this terraced garden really is diminished when we can't um, make our gardeners feel safe about the places that uh, make them really happy. As we've heard from a lot of folks in, in the neighborhood on, as we've walked around, a kind of a common theme, mm -hmm. which is um, feeling safe, their perception of crime, mm -hmm. um, how that impacts both residences and people who run small businesses. And we hear that all of the city, actually. And, 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 and if I could just say, you know, I think that um, there are um, organizations and individuals that do a, a great job of partnering with our local uh, representatives of our Seattle Police Department. One of the challenges, I think, about working with populations and neighborhoods where there are not just linguistic differences, but also cultural differences, um, you know, we often hear uh, that reports make, you know, reporting incidences make a big difference in how much attention a neighborhood gets. Well, for a lot of our community members, especially if they're elderly uh, residents who've maybe been in the United States for decades but come from places where uh, uh, figures of authority are not friendly, it's a challenge for um, us to encourage our elderly residents um, or just even a busy small business owner to take the time to make the call and to deal with the you know, police reports. Um, and so there's a lot of work that's going on, um, especially uh, with uh, uh, the neighborhood block watch to try to educate our residents. And we need to do, I mean, Alan has been doing that for, Alan Lau earlier has been doing that for, for decades. But um, that is a challenge that we continue to face in this neighborhood. Great, thank you very much. This has been an interesting yeah. uh, tour. It's great. Well, I think we've learned a lot. Right. And well, thank you so much, Mr. Ng, for coming out. Yeah. And of course, we're so grateful to Interim. I mean, what you are doing day to day, helping people get housing and get food. And Jonathan, thank you just for what the good cheer that you bring to all of us. I really am grateful to you. The good news that I was going to share is that our chickens laid their first eggs yes. today. <laughs> yes. That's great. So I got to be here when the poultry palace was first built. And I was so impressed. It was AmeriCorps workers and Jonathan, and these are the happiest chickens you have ever seen because the people that are working in the gardens throw their weeds into the chickens, and they're fat and they're healthy, and the kids can come and just pick them up and love up the chickens. It's great. So Thank bringing you. us back to um, yeah, sorry. common stuff here. <laughs> sorry. I hope we don't lay an egg with the budget. Yeah. But uh, one of the reasons we wanted to do this walk is because in the next couple of weeks, we are going to start making some pretty significant decisions about how we allocate city resources right and it's important uh, as we've heard today that we get out in the neighborhood we hear people both business owners community residents the young the elderly everyone so we have that perspective when we make these decisions because right. uh, we're going to make some tough ones right and tim burgess you've been great and i appreciate your leadership on this committee well thank you sally Bankshaw. you too <laughs> i think we'll adjourn is that okay. all right with you second any, that any motion objection all right good thank we'll you. be adjourned and thank you everyone for coming out with us Thank you. Thank yeah, you thank you. Yeah.